other clarifications? Ms. Quick, show in. Uh, Finance Minister, thank you for the extended explanation you gave on taxes and borrowing and reserves. Uh, I will definitely be referring to the Hansard when I prepare for future GP lectures. Uh, uh, so, so I have a request and a clarifying question. Uh, the request is, uh, can I request that um, slides uh, be made available to the public and that MOF actually engages with youth educators, specifically for general papers, social studies and econs, to help them actually facilitate a deeper conversation with young people about this because uh, I think it's a conversation that's going to come up again and again. And uh, many teachers actually feel very inadequate at explaining this and may give um, wrong understanding. Um, for the clarifying question, um, I understand that the full size of the reserves can, can never be revealed for strategic reasons. Uh, but the absence of public information about the size of reserves and the rate of return uh, makes it quite hard for the average layperson, especially like the educators, to have a meaningful conversation uh, about it. And the problem with the vacuum of information is alternative narratives are filling the gap. Some are obvious, deliberate misinformation, and some are just different um, from the government story. So uh, I, I read an OCBC economist suggestion that we could split the reserves into two parts. One as a base for generating the NRC that can be publicly disclosed, and the other is used to the other that is used to deter currency speculations can be kept secret. Um, so I was wondering if the finance minister could give his take on this suggestion. Is it for finance? Well, I, I thank Ms. Quick for your question. So on on the first request, on can we make the slides and the information available to uh, your young people and our educators? The answer is certainly, you know, and uh, if there are particular <coughs> information or analysis that you think are useful, I'll be happy to uh, uh, get my colleagues to work on that because I think an informed discussion is important. Now, as to your second question, that you understand the need for our reserve numbers not to be reviewed because it serves as a strategic, uh, it's, it's a strategic asset. So I, I hope that you appreciate that in a world of uh, major currency transactions every day and that given the size even the size of our reserves is tiny by international standards you know it's tiny by the amount of transactions that are going on around the world every day and we are an important financial center so the answer to the suggestion about can we split it into two parts I've actually considered that, and I don't think it is a sound thing because if you want to, there will still be speculation as to how big that part is, right? And two, the MAS's uh, official foreign reserves are actually in the data. In the, it, it is publicly available as to how big is the MAS's official foreign reserves. And that is a way of thinking about it. It is one part of it. but. As for the rest, should we uh, look at it more? Should we review more? No. I think the, having gone through the Asian financial crisis, and I was uh, serving as the PPS to uh, Minister Mentor then, and looking at how various countries were managing their reserves and managing the currency speculators, it was the most important lesson for me as a young officer that never underestimates how the profit motive can destroy countries. It happened very, very swiftly, and I have to say that rather unfortunately, many of our many of the countries that were very deeply affected adopted policies that looked very good at that point in time that seems like they were doing the right thing. But the reserves were gone very, very quickly. And it took them years and years to rebuild that. And having gone through the global financial crisis when I was running MAS, I was even more concerned that the Asian crisis, we all thought that maybe financial crisis <coughs> and you know, only developing countries are vulnerable to financial crisis. But when this crisis happened. It, was, it originated in the most developed economies in the world, amongst the most sophisticated financial centers. 
in US and Europe, and then it spread to all the rest of us. And uh, we in Asia were lucky that all those new products, new innovations, had not had such a strong uh, foothold yet, although it was coming. So I think let's be very careful about dealing with finances, dealing with our reserves, dealing with our global financial markets. It is easy to suggest that let's do this and that, but we really think through, we really have to think through the implications very, very carefully, and that we must continue to monitor how global financial markets are developing. Even as I speak, new rules are being made, not only about global finances, but about global taxation. And uh, these rules are going to change. And in my budget speech, I spoke about how the center of economic activity is moving uh, towards Asia. And I also added a line that the global order will change. And I think Mr. Lau Tia Kiang hoisted that point. And therefore, let us think very hard about all the things that we need to do and make sure that we provide a sufficient buffer. And on that note, <coughs> the question is, the Parliament approves the financial policy of the government for the financial Mr. year Mr. 1st Can April. I have a clarification? I'm moving on. The question is that Parliament approves the financial policy of the government for the financial year 1st April 2018 to 31st March 2019. As many as of the opinion say aye. aye. And the to the contrary say no. Minister for Finance. Uh, Mr. Speaker, sir, this is an important motion on this import on a very important issue. And after uh, the discussions, the debate that we have in Parliament, um, the Workers' Party has not made clear its stance on the government's financial policy. So I either have a clarification from Mr. William now that you support the financial policy of the government, or I will ask for a division, sir. Uh, 